how to cultivate positive, like, memory? So actually, um, almost exclusively, if you just remove the bad stuff, you'll be happier and better off. It's, you don't even need to amplify anything positive. You just take out all the crap parts, and then things tend to be quite good. Do you have any negative memories at all? <laughs> oh yeah, so I was in, I'll tell, this, I'll tell you a short story, and then I'm going to move on. Um, let me go past this terrible pedophile. <laughs> um, okay, so I was in a seven-year relationship with a girl, and at the end of that relationship, uh, we broke up, and I broke up with her. And, uh, it was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 it gets bad for me, wait. And um, so I left, and I came back to get my stuff, because we lived together, and I found she'd taken all of my stuff and put it in our cement driveway, and poured gasoline over it, and then lit it on fire. <laughs> so this is, I, I, I say all, and people think, you don't really mean all. I mean she deleted the cloud backup. She wiped all of my email. My computer, my digital backups for computer, all of the research I'd ever done, everything in my entire life. The baby blanket that I was raised in was burned to ash. Uh, this is a very impactful moment. Uh, um, so as you can imagine, that was a very emotionally impactful moment for me. Uh, and I, I sort of was like, it's overwhelmed. Like, how do you cope with this kind of incredibly horrible thing? And the way that I did it was that I erased all emotional impact of her from my life. So, <laughs> so think about that for a second. So uh, think about that for a moment. So it means like every positive memory I wiped to neutral. So that means like I don't think about her, except when I tell the story. Like she's just a non-entity. In the same way that you didn't think about the chair you sat in earlier, it just doesn't matter. Yes? So what's the difference between that and reframing a memory and like repressing something that you need to deal with? Oh, completely. So this is not about repressing, because I can think about it and it doesn't hurt. Like there's no pain, right? It's just, like you don't think negative things about the chair you're sitting in. Uh, sorry, there's many questions, but I'm going to run out of time and I want to try to get through all of this. So um, ask me questions afterwards. Okay, excellent. So let's go over some basic things. So uh, again, much like the eye movement, uh, there's categorically, generally speaking, seven emotions. Who here has seen the TV show Lie to Me? Oh, wow. That's awesome. Okay, um, so I'm going to use slides from that show because that show is excellent. Uh, they have some bad science in that some components are pretty good. Like these seven basic emotions are pretty universal. Um, the reason this is useful and the reason I want to teach it to all of you is so that you can use, learn to recognize it in other people, but more importantly, that you can learn to recognize it in yourself. So that when you're trying to talk to somebody, and let's say you're emoting anger or fear or surprise, maybe you don't want to. So, going through these, let's try to recognize what anger is. Everyone knows what anger is, right? You're angry. Um, many, many people emote anger at inappropriate times when they're feeling different things and they're not necessarily trying to communicate that. But much more common than anger is contempt. And contempt is subtle and brutal. There's that coworker you have, they write shitty code. You just like, you sort of like, you think very little of them, and you think they don't notice, but when you talk to them, they can tell that something's off, and it's probably because you're emoting contempt. Contempt is moral superiority. You think you're better because you're a better human than them, just generally speaking. And it's worth noticing it is asymmetric, which is like one face, one half of the face raises. Uh, you can't really see me terribly well, but this is the slide. I'm happy to show you in person what exactly it looks like. Uh, and it's worth noting specifically exactly what this is because you almost certainly do this and then your relationships suffer. Your ability to go with your coworkers suffers. The general things that you want in life get less attainable because you're emoting these things. And if you see somebody do it to you, it's worth being aware of it because now you know where they're coming from. You may not agree, but at least you know. And disgust. Disgust is fantastic in that it's very, very visceral. People tend to combine that face with feelings in their stomach of horribleness. Um, so these slides will be available afterwards. But mostly, I just want you to try to be aware of like, what this looks like, so that way you can begin to notice it when talking to people around you. Try to notice these sorts of things when talking to people also after this talk. Like, walk around, look at each other, notice these. 
probably not going to get very much contempt and disgust. Uh, you might get a little bit of fear, maybe for some socially awkward people, you can all swarm them. <laughs> Eyebrows go up, eyes go wide, panic. Uh, hopefully you see a lot of happiness. So the canonical way to distinguish fake happiness from real happiness, does anybody know? The eyes, yes. But specifically it's the crow's feet. Um, this is part of the reason why Botox is bad. Um, also, what makes this useful is that you can learn how to fake many of these emotions to some degree or another. Although, like trying to learn how to fake it well is an art, it takes practice like juggling. Um, and of course, then sadness. Uh, maybe it's all of you saw sadness earlier during our exercise. You can think back to those spaces for a moment. Very kind of like listless. And surprise. So the key thing to remember here is that most of these motions, when they're genuine, they don't last very long. One of the best ways to recognize that someone's faking something is that they do it for too long. Genuine emotions come, and then they fade out, and your face returns kind of to normal. You're like, oh, it's so good to see you. This is amazing. Everything is fantastic. Yay. Something clearly seemed off. I should have stopped smiling a while ago. So uh, to do this, and to do this well, you need to practice, and you need to be aware of it. And luckily, you talk to people continuously, because we're all humans, we do this all the time, and then you can look at other people and just practice seeing these things in the people around you. You can do this constantly. This is much more, it's not about availability of people to do this with, so much as like just the intention from your side to keep doing this. Great, so any questions about that before we go on? Yes, in the back. Uh, when you talk to someone, yes. and you're trying to gather information about what they're thinking, Okay. What are you looking at? Are you looking at their eyes and their whole face? Uh, how do you... Like what, what do they say, like, the different steps of mastering something? You learn it, you practice it, and then you forget all of it, and you just do it automatically. So that's what you should aim for. But to get there, you need to first be aware of it and just practice the specifics. Um, so who here knows what anchoring is? Wow, there's a very educated people in this talk. This is amazing. <laughs> About obscure things. So usually the way people recognize anchoring is that in a relationship, you come home after work, you see the person that you're with, and you say, my day was really shitty. And then you tell them how shitty your day was. And then every time you see them, you feel shitty. It's so strange. <laughs> uh, it's because you unfortunately turn this person that you care about into the feeling shitty and talking about how shitty everything is. Because you've created this anger. It's just a trigger for some emotional response. And probably the most universal form of this is all of queer's parents. Oh, sure. many of you, that's amazing. Um, so, if you ever did something when you were younger and you got in really big trouble, they maybe used your full name and that certain voice tone that you know means you're in deep shit, that voice tone is a trigger. It's the same sort of thing. It's a triggered some emotional response, probably for fear, maybe for uncertainty, but you all have these sorts of things. And recognizing when those emotional triggers happen is very, very valuable for you. Maybe you have that one coworker that, like I said, writes terrible code. And every time you see them, you think, oh God, they're going to talk to me. And then you feel crappy every time you look at them. Unfortunately, that whole person now has become an emotional trigger. And it's worth knowing what these are intentionally, because you can both create them and how you create them with the people around you. Maybe you see someone nice. In our exercise earlier, it was great. The hugging is a beautiful emotional trigger. When you hug somebody, you feel close. It's a full body experience. And it then anchors that emotion in a different way than you're used to. And hopefully then you can become aware of what these triggers are. Um, this is also valuable for you because then you can start to recognize when you have these same sorts of things happening yourself. Okay, who here watched the movie Inception? Yeah, so many. Um, I also watched it. <laughs> um, so what is Inception? It's this idea of trying to get somebody else to come up with an idea that they think is theirs, that you seemingly did not give them, but you want them to think of it. And you've all played the game Taboo, no, some people, where you have this idea and you have to talk around that word. So uh, this is sort of like the intersection of many of the things I've talked about. You want to try to have influence in a variety of different ways, and then you want to talk to somebody but never actually mention the subject. But when they bring up the thing or they bring up something closer to what you want them to think, you encourage that direction you reinforce it positively. You look happy, you look engaged, and then when they start to stop doing that, you can look away. You can look um, there's lots of examples of this um, from people having like, ideas that plant into their mind. 
to like some kind of social engineering that happened. So you can just do this with simple like reinforcement of attention. Uh, MIT did this great thing where all the students in one class would pay more attention to the professor when they stood in a certain part of the room and less than they stood in another. And they talked over time to get the professor to walk into a corner and then teach his class from a corner. <laughs> where he thought it was his idea. He thought this was like the correct way to go about doing this. But this is the same type of conception. Inception people think is only about ideas. It can also be about behavior, about like intent, like values, things that you prefer, one thing or another. How do you get someone to like chocolate, not vanilla, for example? Uh, question. Yes. Oh no, no, no question. Okay. So is this clear? Do you understand? All of you are doing this immediately. Excellent. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, in the back. An example of the way you use this recently. <laughs> um, so I said earlier, I work at Google. And um, part of my job is hurting engineers to do things they don't want to do. And one of the best ways to get an engineer to do something they don't want to do is to make it their idea, not yours. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do this. The way that I did this most recently was, who here likes tracking things? Oh, like progress reports? They're amazing. TPS reports? Um, what you do is, uh, there's this, a very simple way to do this, what's called the three-question method. Is anyone familiar with that? So you go to somebody and you're like, so I'm working with this engineer, their project is falling apart, like they're behind. And you can ask them three questions and just let people talk. The first one is, what is your plan? Like, what is your plan to make this happen? And then they tell you something. And you're like, great. Um, how is it going? <laughs> and they're like, well, it's not going very well. <laughs> and you're like, oh, uh, so are you ahead or behind? And they're like, well, I'm very far behind. And you're like, would you like me to help you? And they're like, I'd love you to help me. I'm like, great. How do you think I could do that? <laughs> and like, you can just subtly guide them up to the point where he's writing weekly status updates for me. It's great. Um, and the reason they're doing it is not because it's my idea. It's not even because it's the right thing to do. It's because it came from within them. They had a problem. They recognized it. Again, the fundamental part of this is just being aware of what the issue is and then trying to use different tactics and approaches to engage with this in a way that's systemically changing. Because again, this isn't about tricking him into writing the reports. It's about helping them do something that's more effective in their behavior. Like, because of this, they now write better code. Because I was like, maybe writing the code all by yourself is a bad idea. <laughs> a thought. Uh, and so now he collaborates, which is excellent. Because if you collaborate, you become better, generally speaking. And he was against collaboration. It's not that I tricked him into collaborating. It's that I made him realize that not collaborating was ineffective. Uh, you've all heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is becoming very popular. Um, similar kind of problems. Um, the, basically, the issue is that if you're very smart and you think you know things, you're impossible. it's very it's harder for you to recognize when you don't know things because you think you know it all. Everyone suffers from this, especially smart people that work in San Francisco and go to salons. Um, skill is a better term. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Um, you said skill is a better term. Uh, that's true. And so what you can frequently do is assume the person that you're talking to is smart and capable, and all you need to do is help them become aware of the fact that what they're doing is ineffective and then people tend to like to do the effective thing. Like, writing a report on how it's going makes him more effective, that's why he wanted to do it. I didn't, I mean, you can say that you accepted the idea, which is true also, because I wanted him to do this. But that's one of many potential solutions. I didn't care which one they chose, provided that it was actually effective, and it actually met the goal and met the thing I was trying to do. So that's all the things I have in my talk. Look at this turn off again. Um, yes, question. So if I wanted to use these powers for not people, yes. you know, that might not be a power, but uh, yeah, but like something you were saying earlier about the impact of uh, the single large emotionally impactful events can kind of wipe out a lot of the factual data around it. Absolutely. Uh, so something I hear a lot is like people don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel. Yeah. If you're theoretically a facilitator about things and you want to impress certain data to people, you need to emotionally inspire them. Right? So there seems to be have uh, some balance there where like they remember what you told them, but they also very thought that unicorn gift you used was great. Yes. So if you have any like hot tips for how to inspire uh, an audience towards an action, yeah, completely. Right now. Yeah. So I did this with all of you earlier. So who here thinks that my now ex-girlfriend actually burned everything that I owned? Yep. Because like I could have made it up, right? Because like you'll walk out of here, you may forget everything else, be like, man, this girlfriend burned everything. That was horrible. I would never do that. Uh, 
but like all you do is you craft a story around it. It's always much more about the story that you build around something than the specifics of it. And this is especially valuable because the specifics are sometimes slash frequently wrong, right? The specific way that something is being done is much less important than the direction you're trying to go. If I want all of you to be more aware of things, if I want all of you to start to notice each other and notice in yourself what drives you, like what your emotional triggers are, how you emote, what your face says to the people around you, how to change your own experiences so that maybe if you're feeling trapped or uncertain or anxious in your life, how to change that. How do I go about doing that? I can craft like this interesting story around it, right? And then you can like listen to that story and connect to the story. Because almost nobody connects to some specific idea, but everybody connects to the story. So if you want to get better, practice telling stories, true stories, ideally from your own life. And that really did happen. She really did burn everything. It was unfortunate. I had a moving van that didn't put anything in it. Uh, <laughs> but that's true. And because it's true, it puts this emotional impact on you. This is how you make people feel. If you want people to feel things, tell them true things that happen to you that then relate directly to what you're talking about, and people will remember the things that you're talking about. Yes? Um, there's a lot of really shitty books that have good information deeply, deeply buried in them um, that's very hard to tease out that I wouldn't recommend. Um, one of the better ones, um, which has a lot of what I consider very low quality content with a couple of useful pieces is called The Game. Who here has heard of The Game? Oh, so many of you. Yes, it is basically sort of like trash compressed into a novel. Um, but there's some useful pieces of information in there. I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading it though. Um, most of this is really just about these basic principles and then just applying them to your life. There's not, like I said, this isn't magic. This is really just like juggling. The, the principles are very, very simple. This is just about doing it. Practice telling stories to your friends, and then suddenly you find that you can cause greater emotional impact. You want to get hired in a job? Don't tell people that you're really good or that you have a degree. Craft a story about who you are. You're like, I came from a very poor family. I've always been really passionate about design. I've always thought that it was like this amazing way to change the world. I want to make people care about things that are important. When my grandmother was run over by a car, this is not happening. Then I was sitting there and I was thinking, if only someone had designed this intersection better. And like, th that seems ridiculous, but suddenly all of you will remember that like the reason I care about this is I want to try to make the world a better, safer place. And people connect to you emotionally, they're more likely to help you. Reciprocity. They're more likely to believe that like the things you're doing are meaningful and important. And if you emote correctly, you tell the story correctly, and you talk to somebody in the modalities that they understand, you'll connect to them better. Like, the thing you're trying to convey, which is that you will do really well at something, will be true, because it will actually become true. And again, like I said, this isn't magic. This is literally process. Become aware of it, and then just practice. Uh, yes, question? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to 